question is a question to Dr. Tanner. How is appealing to the original Greek text and coming up with a translation that differs syntactically with the, with the King James Version, but not doctrinally, changing the Bible? I think the idea is that if you, how is re looking back at the Greek, original Greek text and coming up with a new translation that just differs in words rather than doctrine from the King James Version, how is that an example of changing the Bible? I would disagree with the underlying assumption there that you're only looking at syntax. Uh, the example that I brought up a few times in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, deleting words is far more than syntax. I'll give you another example that is far more than syntax. In the book of Jude, the current rendition in just about every translation that is out there says the Lord saved his people out of Egypt. The earliest Greek manuscripts say Jesus saved his people out of Egypt, saying that Jesus was the God of the Old Testament and led the people out of Egypt is doctrinally far different than saying God the Father led the people out of Egypt. There are some very, very huge changes. Those are just two. There are many, many, many that are far more than syntax. They do go to the doctrinal part of things. Uh, question for Pastor Wallace. The Greek manuscript used for the King James is not the Greek text used by most translations. How can you claim that one text underlies the Bible? The Textus Receptus, which was prepared by Erasmus, I believe in 1560, was based on a very limited number of Greek manuscripts that he had available to him at the time. There were some problems in that there were sections that he did not have of Revelation. And so I believe, um, I, I'm not an expert on these things, but I believe that he actually used the Vulgate and translated back into Greek to provide uh, some of the text. The, I don't believe that his text was the one that actually underlay the um, King James. It was, um, I believe, Stephanus' text, which was 1556, roughly. Um, the idea that there are some people in the 16th century who had a limited number of text and may have imported some texts that were out of the mainstream. I don't think it's a problem at all. I think it's a problem that we need to be aware of and try to deal with. But, when, but now we have access to what these Greek manuscripts actually say. And that as I said earlier, uh, roughly 97% <coughs> of them are agreed in all except the most uh, minor issues like the man or that man. Uh, what you have, are a few manuscripts. See, we know that people played with, with the text of the New Testament. Uh, 144 AD, Marcion was a heretic who we know said he took out what he couldn't consider the Judaizing elements of the Gospel of Luke. Well, one of the principles of some scholars, remember, just because someone is doing uh, supposed scholarship doesn't make them right. True science is falsifiable. In the humanities, all too often scholars speculate, and there is no falsification possible. They can say, well, you know, we think that First Chronicles may have been written by a woman. Well, why do you say that? Well, it just seems to have that flavor. Will be. They can make up things all day long. What we find, though, now that we have access to far more manuscripts, is that there is in the Greek, what is known as the received or ecclesiastical text. Erasmus, Stephanus, and others are pretty, are, are pretty good representations of that traditional um, text, but they differ from it. And where they differ from it, we need to, to look carefully at it. I think that it is reckless to take text that have survived, like the Codex Sinaiticus and uh, Vaticanus, Aleph and, and uh, B, as they're often known, which do
do not even agree among themselves and use them to trump what thousands of other manuscripts say. You find, if you, if you read, um, oh, uh, not John Gerstner, um, but, 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 no, Butler University um, Professor of Philosophy, um, Gordon Clark. If you read Gordon Clark, he did a wonderful little book called uh, Logical Criticisms of Textual Criticism. And he points out that they don't even follow their own standards in trying to say what the, the certainty is of various texts. So I think that we, we need to be careful of these things. All right, Dr. Tanner. <coughs> contrary, contrary to your poster, neither the KJV or the Geneva Bible say there is no man good but God, but actually say there is no one good but God. Neither is man in the Greek. How do you respond? You can make that assertion, but the greatest translators translated it this way. I, excuse me if someone in this audience to me does not trump Tyndale, the King James translators, I'm, I'm sorry. Plus, if you logically look at the meaning in Greek or otherwise of the text, it's talking about no people, no one is good except one person, and that's God. I mean, that's the clear implication. You can change the wording, you can tinker around a little bit with the wording as, been, as has been done, but even in the current watered-down King James Version, it has the implication there, which cannot be escaped. That God is the good person. The rest of us are sinners. <laughs> Pastor Wallace, is it not true that all of the verses pertaining to salvation by grace alone apply only to Paul because of his experience, and since none of the other apostles say this, nor does the New Testament, the rest of the New Testament? Um, we, we had a debate actually in this room several years I should 
1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. That, that is the way the office of a deacon was handled uh, in the earliest days of the New Testament church. The Latter-day Saints actually uh, had older deacons who were adults in the earliest days of the Latter-day Saint Church. That is something that has changed over time. The LDS faith believes in line upon line, precept upon precept, as we have in Isaiah, and has no problem with ongoing revelation and with, as you have seen, new scriptures and things that uh, uh, would make more current and more appropriate um, the, the Word of God. That happened throughout the New Testament. That happened throughout the Old Testament. We aren't stuck with the Law of Moses. Things have changed. Christ came and uh, made differences in emphasis. And the same thing has happened today in the Latter-day Saints. Pastor Wallace, <clears throat> the most conservative estimate is 240,000 changes between Bible texts, including 1 John 5, 7 through 8. How can you say it's minor? I, I disagree with the assertion. Uh, 1 John 5, 7, the um, Johannian comma, as it's known, uh, exists in all of two Greek manuscripts anywhere. It showed up in an old Latin translation going back to the third, fourth century uh, when, when Erasmus was making his critical text of the New Testament. Uh, the dialogue was supposed to be, the Pope asked him if he was going to include it. He said, if you can show me one text that has it, I'll include it. And he presented him with one that some people think that he may have invented. The, the idea that there's a problem, 1 John 5, 7, is, um, says there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and only uh, goes to these three or one. I'm just paraphrasing. Um, the, I don't think it belongs. I think it is um, an insertion that is very clearly there. Out of the thousands of manuscripts, it shows up in two. And we're supposed to say, oh, this is to be taken seriously. No. I think that, um, you know, we don't have to base the deity of Christ on 1 John 5, 7. We, can, uh, we have John 1, 1. We have Philippians 2. We have Colossians 2. We have um, Jesus being stoned. Or they're, they're wanting to take up stones to stone him because he's made himself equal with God. Uh, I, I, I hear these assertions made, but when you actually get into the nature of them, it's not nearly what is portrayed. Don't take my word for it. Don't take other people's word for it. Uh, if it if it means a great deal to you, you know, the statement that was made earlier, I can show you. Um, people in Geneva, they didn't believe God was an exalted man. Um, I don't know, you know, I don't carry the Geneva Bible around in my head. Go check it for yourself. If it if it does say it, I don't think it proves anything, but I think that. If it doesn't say it, then we have to wonder about the other assertions that are made. Hey, Dr. Kim, uh, you said the Presbyterians are good Christians. How can, how can that be said when Joseph Smith said all the priests were an abomination and the people were corrupt and there was no true church on earth? He even mentioned the Presbyterians by name. What happened to the only true church? Well, Christians are attempting with all their might, like Latter-day Saints, Presbyterians, Baptists, are good Christians. I, I believe that Joseph Smith made similar comments. There's a difference between uh, someone who has a misconception or an inappropriate uh, way that they take a look at Scripture, their own personal interpretation of it, and somebody who is not good. As um, Pastor Wallace said, those who are justified are justified, and um, there will be there will be many people. Well, I'll even 
and say it a different way. I doubt there is a single person who has every doctrinal point correct. That does not make every person a bad person just because they are in error on some slight point of doctrine or even some major. Okay, one more question for each of our uh, debaters tonight. From Mr. Wallace. Then, then who put the Bible together, men or God? Can God add more to his word if he likes? I assume the meaning of the question is, God, why can't God, if God wrote the Bible in the first place, why can't he add more uh, to it? Well, I think that it is clear that the Old Testament was given by prophets that were clearly attested that they were prophets of God. They were attested in terms of what they were teaching. Were they teaching a different God? They, they did signs and wonders, and yet they also were attested to be in accord with what had been said before. When we come to the New Testament, uh, the apostles had been given the authority to bind and to loose, which if you go back and check, you'll find that that authority is what was claimed by the scribes, that they had the power to authoritatively interpret the Old Testament. You remember Jesus talking about <coughs> having heavy burdens on uh, people and not so much as lifting them with one of your fingers. The disciples were given the power to bind and loose, to authoritatively interpret these things. If you look at Paul's defense of his apostleship in Galatians, that is a very important thing. Paul wasn't simply speaking what he thought was nice. He had been commissioned by God. And the signs of an apostle followed him. And he was, uh, he did not submit himself to the other apostles as, as if they were greater. But they attested that he was preaching the gospel, as I quoted Peter, uh, Peter earlier. And so um, I, I think that the, the text of the New Testament, I, I would point you towards F.F. F. Bruce's the New Testament documents, are they reliable? resource. Can God add to that? He has given us the end. God who has hundred times been diverse manners has spoken to our fathers in um, times of old, has now spoken to us through his son. There is a sense in which there is a completion of this in Hebrews and elsewhere. That this is, we, we are given the full picture. We're given our marching orders and we're told what awaits. Um, people come offering a newer New Testament, what is it that is insufficient? The, the idea that there are people who disagree on these things. Well, there are homosexuals who disagree with what the Bible says. They, they say, oh no, the Bible actually permits this and encourages it. We had a debate um, a couple buildings over to that effect several years ago with someone defending that they were being faithful to God in um, marrying themselves to another man. Just because there's a difference of interpretation doesn't mean the text is unclear. People impose their own meanings. People read what they want to read. When you when you go through the text, you know, I, I hope I'm not stepping on too many toes here. Um, issues like baptism. I mean, don't think that that's a life and death issue, but I think it's an important issue and we need to strive for unity. And so, as a former Baptist, when the opportunity presents itself, I ask my, my brothers who disagree with me, let's be good Bereans. Let's sit down and go through the scriptures together. And let's keep it simple. Let's leave out extra biblical sources. Let's let the Bible interpret its own terms by how it uses them. And some have gone through that with me. They become Presbyterians. Um, there are some that they go through and disagree with me. But unfortunately, most of them find that they're too busy doing other things to actually follow through in the process. The Bible's not unclear. It's just people don't like what it says. We're sinners, even the best of us. So we have to not trust in our hearts, but go back and be reformed according to God's Word. Hey, Dr. Tanner. You've done much to challenge the doctrine and fallibility of the Bible. If the burden of proof lies with you, if the KJV Bible is so fallible, why is the LDS Church glorified as equal to the Book of Mormon? Since the Bible comes before the Book of Mormon, are you not challenging, challenging the roots of your church? Uh, it seems to me the Book of Mormon is not in accord with the Bible, but different. Well, uh, I guess that's a conclusion that, uh, that the writer of that made. Uh, 